Hello and welcome to ClapperCast. I'm your host as always, Carson Tamar, and today, for, to celebrate the release of the Tortured Poets Department, myself, Paul Price, and special guest Thomas Stoneham Judge looks back at the filmography of one Taylor Swift. From Hannah Montana the movie to Amsterdam, we review every single one of her movie and TV performances, put them on a tier list, and discuss how Blondie has done on the big screen, and then we get into our thoughts of the Tortured Poets Department. It's a fun bonus episode here at the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Now let's get to ranking every single Taylor Swift performance. And we start the journey through Taylor Swift's filmography, uh, possibly with her least performance role out of all of them. She plays Taylor Swift in Hannah Montana, the movie. I'll be really honest. I have not. Girl in Barn, actually. She was credited on Wikipedia as Taylor Swift. So (laughs) Girl in Barn on the credits. (laughs) Wikipedia disagrees, but valid. Um, I'll be really honest. I have not seen this movie. Um, Didn't watch it, but I watched her clip and she's definitely performing. She's definitely Taylor Swift on the stage, you know. Um, I don't know if there's really a lot to get into with this one. Paul, yeah. You have- <laughs> uh, this was one that, like, we added at the last second because it was, like, just for completionist's sake. Um, I started the movie and I was like, is she actually in this or is it just going to be? And then I went and looked um, and it was like, oh no, she's just in this one little song. So I did go watch the YouTube clip. It's just her singing. It's fine. It's nice. It would be like, but it's the same as saying, like, oh, she's in the Jonas Brothers movie because she sings one song. Um, but, like, uh, no, it, it was fine. Um, you know, it's interesting to see that that's where she started um, more than anything, especially when we go into the next thing that she did is like a complete 180 from this. Um, also strange, like, and we'll talk about this throughout, but strange when you look at someone like Rihanna or Beyonce, who also has been like trying occasional acting, she never stars in anything. She never like oh, we're doing a rom-com and it's Taylor, or it's like, you know, oh, she's a thriller and she's the star, like, never. And there's so many periods in her career where you're like, couldn't you have, especially around reputation to love her, you would expect that she would have been like, okay, acting's not, you know, know, uh, singing may is maybe kind of falling apart a little bit, you know, I'm not doing the numbers I was, Um, let's do a movie. And she just never does. Um, I feel like there's probably a bunch of corpses of potential projects, but... (laughs) I think even when you look at Gaga, right? Like she did like horror story, right? Like Taylor Swift never even did something like that. It's always I mean, we're gonna go through each one, but it's always like a small, almost cameo. I mean, maybe her next draft for this is the most substantial she has. Like it's weird that she never even tried to do like a TV show or something. Yeah. It's actually, it's really interesting. Well, firstly, let's talk about the credit. I really want to go look and see if the credits actually credit her as Girl in Barn, because who would have the audacity (laughs) to to relegate Taylor Swift down to Girl in Barn? And I think that that really, if that's the case, that actually is a testament to kind of like where she was in her career at that time. And that, that would never be a thing. Even if she is literally a girl standing in a barn, she will be yeah. credited Taylor Swift and on the cover. Literally all she has to do is stand in the barn and she will be credited in the movie. So I think I that's a, bit, a very interesting observation there. Girl in barn. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, cause I remember seeing it and I was like, wait, why? Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I also think that's the point when they were like, we'll just get any singer. Yeah. Like Hannah Montana was so big. And then Taylor, this was around fearless, but pre uh fearless kind of hitting off so just like mm-hmm. love story what, i forgot what even the song was because i watched this really early do you remember what song she does yeah that's no. bad <laughs> um yeah i i also didn't didn't watch this movie i don't think i uh ever well it was not on the list it, it was just a last <laughs> second like hey let's oh she's just uh crazier <laughs> Mm. what an interesting choice and it's just kind of on in the background she's literally on screen for two minutes and 31 seconds like it's nothing um do you have the percentage of movie that is no 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 not for that one i I only did it for the major roles that we did originally Uh, so for these um matthew stewart who does all the screen time um for like gold derby and all this um i wrote him and i was like hey can i pay you to uh, grab all of Taylor's major roles. So he sent them and they're actually really funny because some you're like, Oh, she's in it a lot. And no, she's not or vice versa. Um, so, but her next role was another TV one. 
Right. So let's, I mean, let's close the chapter on Hannah Montana, the movie, I think. Um, where on the tier ranking would you put those two minutes of background performance? Back in the vault, I guess. It's also not a good song. Like, Crazy is not, like, a hit. Like, if we were doing, like, Shoulda Said No or, like, Love Story, yeah, let's let's move it up. But, like, we don't need it. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's it's going, to, it's one of those pieces of ephemera more than, like, a real acting role. I, I would agree. Back to the vault. Yeah, I'm fine with back to the vault. I probably would go a little higher. I would go. She tried because you know what? With everything she did, she did well in this. Mm-hmm. But I'm fine with back <laughs> to the vault. Little 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 performance. Um. So uh, yeah, right after that, um, she was on CSI as a corpse, and um, we decided at the last second to watch this one as well because it's famous for being the Taylor dresses like a little goth girl, um, and. I went and watched it expecting it to be like a normal CSI where she's just, you know, it's the corpse and maybe she has like one scene. No, this is like a very sad, very slow, tragic story where uh, it's just about how awful this girl's life is and then ends with her murder. And like you're watching it and you're like, <laughs> did Andrea be like, yes, this is a good choice for you because it's insane. You're watching it and it's just like, she's pretty good in it actually but like the storyline is just not what you would expect in that area era of her career is like to do something so dark and it's not even a fun you know like justin bieber like got shot up in um his episode but like this is just bleak and sad and it's also like why would you cast a pop star to be in this episode um almost to me felt like they were trying to do it for a play to like get a couple like emmy noms or something not for her specifically but people will watch Mm -hmm. this episode and it's the taylor swift one and this is the one where we're trying something because it didn't even feel like a csi you were pretty sure the entire time who the killers were and they were it wasn't like a big shock but like um uh, what do you think carson as far as an episode of CSI, I didn't think this was anything that crazy. What I will say is crazy is Taylor Swift in this. She's like a very dramatic, brooding figure. There's times where like in the rain, you'll pan to her and she's just standing there looking like sad or mischievous. Um, it's very odd. The emo turn at the end, she did really go full hot topic. And it's also strange in just like this era. We did an episode where we reviewed every single concert film. So I feel like we have a pretty good grasp on like the image she was putting out at the time. Uh, This is not when she was going darker or when she was like, this is fearless. This is speak now. You're like, this is not (laughs) the image. Uh, You know, this is her on stage saying some people can just be so mean um, with singing with like a banjo and like a, you know, wooden structure. And she has, and she has the accent still. Yeah. She's still got the twang. Um, So basically how the episode starts is she's Taylor Swift. Like they show her dead body and she's an emo girl. And then they cut back and she's like normal Taylor Swift, blonde hair. And the next time they show her, she has brown hair now. Or flip that. She has brown hair, then she has blonde hair for no reason. They're like, oh, she wanted to be like another girl in school. And then the next time they show her, she's emo. And then, uh, spoilers for a CSI episode, she gets murdered by her mom because she has a hairstyle the mom doesn't like. Because it reminds her of, it gets really convoluted, but like, (laughs) like she just stabs her with scissors because she was trying to cut her hair off. The dangers of being emo. It can happen to you. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I had thought it was a when I saw the image of Taylor in um, all emo, uh, I had assumed that it was like a fake image that someone had done, like photoshopped her head onto someone else. Nope, it's from the show. Mm-hmm. So that was really fun. Um, I also say she's young enough that there are times when watching this where you're like, is that Taylor Swift? And like, because yeah. she has a different haircut again every single time we see her. Yeah. So there are times where I'm like, is that who is that? And I'm like, oh, I hear him. And it's, oh, it's, it's Taylor also that yeah, it's, it's that twang. But like, it also isn't the voice we know anymore. So it was just like we I only knew it from Fearless, the the um, concert movie. Um, this, this is yeah. uh, so I, I didn't watch the episode, but I was probably equally confused when I watch the clips uh, and it's <laughs> jumping between the different hairstyles. And I'm just like, what is happening in this episode? So yeah. I got to see like her performance and I mean, it's, it's young. Uh, it's, it's a very um, early Taylor Swift acting, uh, you know, and, but, but yeah, I was, 
I was just like, there must be some context I'm missing, or maybe there's multiple episodes on this. Like I have no yeah, idea what's that's what I thought too. Um, because I watched the <laughs> clips first because I assumed um that it wouldn't be on streaming. You right. know, it's just like older shows like that. You're like, it's probably nowhere, and you have to buy it. Um, so I just watched the clips and then I was like, let me go check. And it was on Hulu. So I watched it, but like, even with context, you're still like, this is a very convoluted episode. I could not tell you the plot. So basically like her mom is not really her mom. And she's like adopted by this other woman who accidentally killed her adopted mom's daughter. I don't know. And like, I was trying to figure out the plot line and I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like it's, it's real bad in terms of the the writing, but yeah, it was fun to just click through. Cause I did the same thing. I watched it, probably the exact same mm-hmm. YouTube video, but uh, yeah, she's, she's a young one in that, but it's fun. It's cool that this is the most she acts in. I would guess mm-hmm. I don't have the, um, the screen time, but like, this is definitely her biggest acting role, which again, weird. Everything goes downhill for me. And the next thing we're going to talk about is another one of her big ones. So where would you rank this, Paul, on this tier? She did her best. Like, this is, like, pretty intense for, like, someone who hasn't acted before. Like, it's not amazing, but, like, it's pretty impressive to, like, go on the stage and, like, you know, do all this, especially with all the haircuts and things that they're doing, and that she has to play, like, four different versions of the same character. It's it's pretty impressive um, for being that young. Uh, but yeah, it's not like, it's not amazing. I'd probably also say she did her best and I can only hope that there is something she got out of this that helped influence her career going forward, uh, for the better. Like maybe, (laughs) maybe we, we would have had a different reputation if she hadn't done this role. (laughs) (laughs) It is funny to imagine her being like, wait a second. What if I... (laughs) Right. <laughs> we just needed the nose ring and we would have been perfect. Right. <laughs> I would agree. I think in this, we're going to have to, especially later on, really judge like, uh, how are we separating Taylor Swift from the film or project she is in mm-hmm. as far as quality? I think the show itself, this episode is very bad, I'll be honest. But I do think she tried. I think with everything she was given, she tried. Um, yeah. So I would put that there. Um, now going to probably her first feature film role like a proper role um we have her in valentine's day as felicia miller she is kissing taylor lautner there's not a lot again of taylor swift here it's not a substantial performance um but she is certainly here trying um and i think again one of the better parts of this movie like when I even just the character, like if it was cast as someone else, like whenever this like dopey little girl kept showing up, I was like, this is fun. Mm -hmm. I'm having a good time. And then it would get to the drama of these people's relationships. And overall, I actually liked this movie a lot more than I was expecting. But like um, every time it cut to her, especially in comparison to Emma Roberts, who I did not care about any of that plot line. I was like, this is fun. And I love that it just ends with her being happy with her boyfriend. There's no like everyone else goes through all this stuff. And it's like, no, she just was happy the whole time. And <laughs> I wonder got a giant she, bear. <laughs> I wonder if she wrote that into the contract. I have an image to maintain and you're using my song. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, my God, I completely forgot about that. That's yeah. the wildest part. Yeah. Is that just in the middle of it, <laughs> they start playing a different version of one of her songs. Right. <laughs> oh, no, that's CSI. CSI oh, was the one that they did the uh, needle drop, and it was like a remix of one of her songs. Uh, this one was just a straight version. Yeah, of of, uh, uh, of today was a fairy tale. Today was right? a fairy tale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's uh, and it's and it's so meta that they play it for her scene. It's not even like we want to use this for the movie. It's specifically advertising Taylor Swift. Um, I, I just like I, and I know that that was an intentional choice, and I know that that was probably written into the contract. And I love the meta ness of it. <laughs> I, I also love that once again, she's bringing along her boyfriend uh, or not boyfriend, but like Taylor Lautner specifically mm-hmm. uh, to get a little career boost. <laughs> it's like at that point, he was not really doing anything outside Twilight. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, let's give it to him. Uh, also, the song from CSI was You're Not Sorry. And the remix is actually pretty good. Um, <laughs> I listened to it like I was like one of those things. I was like, oh, I kind of wish you'd like put that on uh, <laughs> TV. Just like. <laughs> um someone make a bootleg vinyl and paul will buy it um yes 
I'm kind of shocked you liked Valentine's Day, Paul, because I thought it was like awful. Not to be like, I and I don't need a very uh, complex plot. We're going to talk about one later on here that I love that's very simplistic. Um, there was something about this that was just like boring. Like what 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 did you like about this movie? I think I, I, think I just liked that it like constantly was just like insane. Like I didn't know the plot at all. So you're watching and it was just like, it really felt like someone was like, and then, and then, and you're like, okay, but like, <laughs> you know, um, having uh, Jennifer Gardner like walk in and pretend to be a waiter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, that was a, that was a so, fun scene. <laughs> there's so many dumb things in this movie that I'm like, uh, that they have like these random friends that like appear in one scene and you're supposed to care about them and they never appear again. Um, this girl's party that she's going to have for all single people and no one wants to come. And then everyone comes. It's so dumb. I was just like, I think I was just having a good time. It was also the first one I'd watched. So I was like, all right, let's get through these. Um, and then in hindsight, there's so much bad in here. Um, uh, one thing Gurley's going to do is choose the worst movie. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you know, this is actually a very interesting uh, assessment of roles Taylor Swift typically gets. Um, she is a part of these ensembles of, you know, mediocre at best films. And I don't know why that's such a motif for for her acting career. Um, it's so strange. Yeah, I mean, like, you were mentioning she hasn't headlined anything, which, you know, I'm kind of okay with. I think she's saving that for... Uh, something special which which is which is good that that's fine you can do your totally, little cameos but, yeah yeah well but what's so weird is like you look at her career especially when we're talking about like concert films and like going through all her music and stuff it's like at this point she kind of needed something like mm-hmm. red era and everything like that um is like no like you should probably be doing some tv like it's strange that she didn't ever try mm-hmm. um and I went through and looked and I couldn't find anything that like she'd been circling and didn't do. It looks like she clearly just does these. But then the it begs the question, why is she doing this at all? If <laughs> you know like, what? I get the sense that she was doing this for um for experience for her own projects in the future. And I guess that's probably why she's not as concerned about getting these like avant-garde roles or these like Sundance films or anything like that. She just wants to be in projects so that she can see how film is made. Yeah. I think it's a blend of that and having fun. I mean, if she was taking a role like, you know, you look at Gaga's filmography, not to go back to her, but like she's very clearly trying to get an Oscar, right? She's Mm -hmm. picking roles specifically that will lead her in that direction to try to elevate her status in that world. The Swift is clearly not picking roles, maybe outside of Cats, which some people did think had Oscar potential at first when it was announced. Like she's not picking films that have that buzz even. So I don't think she's very concerned with like, is it a good movie? Is it going to be a successful movie? I think she's a mixture of having fun and just like wanting to see what it's about. And we've seen her kind of start to go into directing and maybe a little bit. So like, I think that is probably why. Well, yeah, yeah, because she she definitely wants to get that exposure to filmmaking for her own projects, which I think any one of her music videos is probably better than any film she's actually been in. <laughs> so yeah. it seems to be a working strategy. Um, we know that uh, All Too Well was a directorial project that she really um, campaigned as her being a filmmaker. She does have a contract with Searchlight to to direct a film at some point. Yeah. Around eras, I guess. I don't know when. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so like I think that she's she's really getting a lot of value behind the uh, from the behind the scenes and just like really taking in how films are made so that she can she can do her own thing better. I mean, on her yeah. website, she has a whole section dedicated to directed projects like she's mm-hmm. very clearly proud of putting this forward as being part yeah. of her work. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. Um, and I think overall, uh, especially with Valentine's Day, this is the kind of movie she likes. Like mm-hmm. she loves these kind of movies. So that probably was very much like, Oh, I get to be in a rom-com. Um, and then, you know, giving her the, the smallest role that you can have, um, and trading it with a song. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, you know, I think it, it's fine. Um, I won't rewatch this, but I am curious. I may watch the rest of the, the series just to like oh, put yeah. it on like as completionists. Um, cause I'm just curious. 
I hear they get worse and worse with each one. So that'll be fun. Valentine's um, Day is so funny because like I, I went back to watch it this week thinking I've watched bits and pieces. But as I'm watching, it, I'm like, I totally forgot. No, I've watched this movie. Watch the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know every scene that I'm watching. I've been OK. I've seen this movie. I just thought like I'd had it on in the background or wasn't paying attention to it or only saw clips. No, I watched the whole movie and just totally forgot that that happened. <laughs> um, that's a funny segue after we do. um uh, the ranking because yeah. that's how I did uh, the Lorax. Actually. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm going to first, did you have screen time for this? Oh yeah. The screen time. Uh, this is one of her most and it is 6.62% um, of the movie and eight minutes and 15 seconds. So like she has some good amount of time in this one. Um, which, you know, is actually really impressive. Uh, it, most of these do not hit. None of them hit over 10% of the movie, by the way. So <laughs> we were doing a lot for a little. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did enjoy that most of these uh, either have her throughout or at the end, because I felt like I was waiting for something. Mm-hmm. Um, it was real rough in one of these where she's only in the beginning. And I was like, well, why am I still watching this? <laughs> like we have done this. Looking forward to talking about that oh. one. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So yeah. Uh, I'm going to say did her best again. I agree. I would, I would say so too. She has a very good makeout sesh with Taylor Lautner. Like it's very passionate. Cool. It's a very like, you know, she goes for it. And I appreciate that from an acting perspective. See, I don't, you know? it's so funny. I don't even remember that. I just remember her little cheer that she keeps doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also we didn't talk about the fact that the news channel is 13 news. Uh, I was yeah. like, come on. <laughs> and she has the little 13 on it. There's so many like, okay. Now that I'm thinking back to this movie, there's so many things that like, um, you know, you notice like as, oh, they were just kind of letting this pop star do whatever she wanted. Yeah, um, oh, absolutely. Especially when she gives him the gift. And I mean, that's obviously the, the most glaring one where he literally says, but that's your lucky number. <laughs> 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 like, we're not hiding anything here, guys. We're just letting oh. them have fun. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, But... Yeah, no, uh, I was looking through my notes to see if there was anything else. Uh, the only other thing I noted was that uh, Taylor Lautner does a black, uh, backflip. And I was that, like, that's oh, that's so right. Funny. He does. And you know <laughs> like, what? I totally cannot forgot to do this. anything without doing his backflip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because didn't he do that when he showed up uh, showed up yeah. on uh, in, on tour? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did it when he was on tour. And then when he went to the tour movie, he did it in front of everyone multiple times and everyone was like what is this is this a thing he does <laughs> and then to see it like pop up years ago it's like oh you just this is like one of your shticks you really do just like, like backflipping that's just yeah. your life's passion <laughs> i was imagining like this is part of their relationship she's just sitting there and he's like look i can do a backflip <laughs> i want to say he did a backflip i saw him when i went to the 2010 kid choice awards i believe he did a backflip yeah. there <laughs> Which I mean, listen, I can't do a backflip. I'm Wait, impressed, but sure. <laughs> but to see it that long ago be such a part of his identity, it, you know, still it's it's an interesting yeah. uh, an interesting quirk. I guess everyone has their thing. Taylor Lautner's is that he does backflips. I'm waiting oh. for his like rena- like when is he coming back? When is his next role? Right? Doesn't it feel like he's like on the verge of that? Where he's like he has to have some Netflix yeah. movie or something coming. His, uh, I will say that his wife on. TikTok, uh, also Taylor Lautner, Taylor Lautner. Um, <laughs> um, is uh, like the fact that she's so well liked. I do think that will help him boost, but he's also like not the best actor. So it'll, yeah, it'll but he's friends cool. with Taylor Swift, and that's money right now, right? Like, yeah, but she doesn't like to do good movies. So <laughs> fair enough, as we have seen. Well, maybe, maybe he shows up in her movie. I don't know. We'll see when she's when she's directing for Searchlight. It's just a can It's a cameo fest of all of her friends. <laughs> yes, it's it's bad blood, but in movie yeah. format. <laughs> oh 
amazing. Well, moving on to the animated space, we do have Audrey from the Lorax next. This is kind of the catalyst for the world being saved in the Lorax. Our main character falls in love with her and her one dream is to have a real tree. She even goes as far as to paint her house to look like a bunch of trees. Um, She loves trees. That's kind of her gimmick. And I think Taylor Swift is very average here. This is probably the biggest one. And maybe because it's animated where I was like, I guess that's Taylor Swift. Like, I, there wasn't really that many quirks. There wasn't really that many references. There really wasn't that much substance here, other than the fact that she does seem down to have like a relationship with this child. That's kind of weird. But other than that, like, it's kind of just child. there. She's what? a child. She's not an adult. How old is she? She's definitely older. No, it's definitely I, weird. A, no, I think she's his age because she lives she, with her parents. It's she's not funny. living in her own place. She's like double his height. Yeah, uh, she, okay, but that's literally Taylor Swift. <laughs> you're I like, all tall women are old. <laughs> I get what you're saying because in Sorry. so I've seen I've seen the Lorax before, and I've left it on in the background and paid no attention to it uh, in in the past. So like, I'm familiar enough with it, but I did go back to watch clips, and I see what you're saying because like, her character visually can come off more mature, and the character is a more mature character. Um, yeah. But I think she is intended to be his age. Even she is she's fourteen. Twice, That's crazy. Twice as yeah, high. She does not come off as being yes. his age. <laughs> like age gap relationship. That's what is why by your name. <laughs> you know what though? That might have actually made that movie a little bit more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> He's just trying That's to the sequel. The we'll get there. <laughs> um, okay, so the weirdest thing about this movie to me, and I talked about this to Carson constantly while I was watching it. How did you cast? Uh, I do not believe that this is the original script. Mm. at all because how do you cast taylor swift and zach efron and then have ed helm sing what happened there <laughs> like i'm watching this whole film and i'm like there's no way like i know she doesn't get a song but where is her song where is his song why is no one singing in this musical except ed helms <laughs> that's such a funny observation <laughs> yeah, it was just like it was driving me insane because I I can imagine that when they were circling the role back in the day, like it was like, oh, OK, we're going to have you sing. And maybe they didn't want to sing. So they like took out one of their songs. But there's no reason you'd cast two of the biggest pop stars at that time and not have them sing like there's just it makes no sense. Um, also, this film is just very confused. <laughs> the stuff that happens in the present is way more interesting than anything happening with the Lorax. Um, I also think it's insane that one tree's made and they're like, oh, the Lorax came back because he's so proud of the guy. Also, just going to say, he had that seed this whole time and didn't mm. plant it. He just kept it for like 60, 70 years. And it's like, uh, we could have a good amount of trees at this point. And he's like, no, no, no. I'll just give it to this one random boy so he could take it on this whole journey into town. It was just like, this is so stupid. Um, that movie really... Contrived really storytelling. Is that, is that not uh, not of interest here? Uh, no, you're, you're totally right. That movie, it makes no sense. Like, it's a, it's... It's a kid's movie based on a kid's book. And they really, I don't think they aimed much higher than that, especially when you get people like Taylor Swift and Zac Efron who appeal to younger people, um, yeah. you know, just, just because of who they were at that time. Um, the, it, there, there was just targeting. It was, I think this movie was more business than it was inter- like a uh, yeah. quality entertainment. Well, um, and what's funny is when we talk about, uh, so the data for this one, I think, is very important uh, based on what you were saying, Carson. It could be anyone. Um, so the character, Audrey, is seen for six minutes and 45 seconds, 7.83% of the movie. But Taylor Swift only speaks one minute and 27 seconds, 1.68% <laughs> of the movie. Okay. So, like, Another- that's why <laughs> it doesn't feel like Taylor's in this movie. She is not. <laughs> <laughs> I need like, a new stat. Audrey's there, but that is not. <laughs> I need a new stat. I want to know how much money Taylor Swift was paid per minute. <laughs> like, per minute? <laughs> <laughs> at least, I mean, it would be at least a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars for a minute. Well, it would be three quarters of her cent- of her salary, right, for the yeah. movie? <laughs> per minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, um, yeah. 
but her like, word that would be interesting. Her, her word, word. There you yeah. go. Um, and then the other interesting thing is "Permanent Marker" is one of her like lost songs, um, and it was only available on the Lorax pre-order from iTunes. Ooh, and it's oh, like, wow. so like, um, that was like one of those fun things that you just find out. You're like, oh, okay. So I guess it might end up on debut TV, but like, who knows? But yeah, the only time that ever happened. Cause I was like, so confused why. And this will be a running thing with her. Why is she not doing a song with this? Mm. I would think if you're saying that she's not a great actress and you're putting her in these movies, why is she not doing a like song that connects? Like, why mm-hmm. are we not every single one of these? It's like, oh, well, the end credit songs fucks because it's Taylor doing her shtick. You mm-hmm. know, why aren't we getting a song about like saving the environment? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, uh, but uh, oh, and then the other thing was I do not understand um, the Onceler at all. I don't find him at all interesting to look at. And I don't understand how there's a whole community of people who are in love with him. And it's Ed Helms. <laughs> Once again, it is Ed Helms. <laughs> you said, sorry, I, I, you said the one slur, and I, I heard the one slur, and I'm like, what did they say? <laughs> yeah, that one slur. <laughs> I didn't understand why it was in there, or the Ed Helms said it. But... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, not, it's, it's like him and Taylor Swift, that kind of adds up. <laughs> the one slur. <laughs> the one slur. Um, but yeah, no, it's so funny, because that's... Uh, and this, I remembered I'd watched this movie very drunk with one of my friends. I don't know why, but um, it was really funny to watch this and be like, okay, um, I'm ready to like get it. And I'm like, I, I don't get this at all. That's it. He's like, I mean, and I guess it was the era, um, just that it was very emo boy. But like, imagine uh, it on Tumblr. Imagine the yeah. Tumblr posts. Like, I get you it. Kind of see like, it, I guess. Still, uh, yeah. The... Well, you know, I can be a little delusional with my takes, and even I didn't see it. So, like, I think that says <laughs> something, right? <laughs> There's just nothing there. Um, oh, yeah, and then I didn't like Danny DeVito. I thought he was terrible in this. But um, like, <laughs> he sounds so much like Danny DeVito, and I know that's part of his shtick, but, like, I never for once was like, oh, yeah, that's a character. It's just a little Danny DeVito, like, popping up. <laughs> um, and I do think in other roles, like, uh hercules he actually does like voice acting even though it is him this literally felt like he walked in phoned it in and was just like i'm danny devito here's how i sound um yeah disappointed i was really hoping to like this one well the entire movie screams to me and you mentioned the no taylor swift song danny devito kind of phoning it in it kind of feels to me like they didn't offer a lot of money and they said just kind of do whatever you want for that little bit of money and they (laughs) came in one day they did their bit taylor spoke for two minutes and then she left you know like i think that's seven seconds (laughs) i'm sure they had to do a retake of a couple of the lines but like not a lot i think of inspiration here right yeah no it was it was rough um yeah, this one I'm uh, I'm gonna say put it in the vault. I, I cause the next one I'm gonna have to rather yeah, so I'm I'm really on the fence with this because ultimately I think that there's a lot of people that, that still gravitate to this movie despite the um nonsensicalness of it and the things that don't make sense about like the casting and the presence of Taylor Swift. And like, you know, I I think there's a lot of very weird decisions that were made for this movie, but despite all of that, I think it's still a movie that is at the forefront of like, um, maybe not the forefront, but still in conversation with like animated films that you throw on for your kids. Um, Yeah. There's, there's some appeal to it still, even if it doesn't appeal to uh, our standards there's something there and so like that I'm, I'm on the fence of like i don't think it's the greatest film um which makes me want to lean towards like put it back in the vault but also there is so much mainstream like uh uh gravitation appeal. to it uh, appeal yeah. that thanks appeal for this film so like that makes me think you know maybe but they didn't try their best i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I think it she does really play well to kids. I thought she loved trees. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, her one line that she got, um, and her oh no, a couple times in the back half. <laughs> um, 
I also I do think it plays well to kids. I remember as a kid, yeah. like my a lot of my friends, myself like this movie. Um, I think Betty White plays well for kids. Like I think it all mm-hmm. plays well for like really young audiences who like also then oh. take the message at the end and be like, "Wow, this is important and it has something to say." I think when you get past the age of like ten, probably that loses steam for you. Mm-hmm. But at least before ten, I think it does work enough. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, we're talking about Taylor Swift's performance. I have to actually move her back up because the hardest I laughed in this movie and probably in this entire all of the films was when she goes, it's called photosynthesis. <laughs> it was so good because it just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> like <laughs> It's the big climactic <laughs> moment. and She's like the biggest little nerd. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, no, I, I love it. Okay. So I'm going to, um, what was the second one? She did her best. I'm moving it up okay, <laughs> just for that is. line. Yeah. I'm going to keep uh, it in the vault for me, but valid right on your journey. You know what? <laughs> I, I'm st- I'm so torn. Um, you know, what? I, I, I'll, I'll, s- no, they didn't do their best. I'm going to say that. <laughs> like I keep coming, like the phrasing of that, of that status just <laughs> makes me downgrade the film or the, the performance. That I, is fair. You know, it's, 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 it's it exists, so maybe back in the vault. <laughs> Paul, do you want to introduce yeah, the next one? Yeah, sure. Um, so in high school, I didn't have to read this book, so I have no like basis for The Giver. Um, I knew that I didn't like the cover. It made me very uncomfortable. That man is very old. Um, like it just like when I would see it, I was like, mm, mortality. Um, <laughs> like, so I just never interacted with it at all, but, um, I didn't even know what this was about and, um, God, it's boring. This is probably oh one of the most boring movies I've ever seen in my entire life. Can, um, can I, can I, can I start on this one? Because this yeah. is the most recent one that I've watched. Um, and it's another one that I went to watch it thinking, I guess I should do my research and watched it. And was like, I saw this movie. <laughs> I just <laughs> forgot that I saw it because oh, yeah. it is so, it's so boring. And not only is it so it's stiff, the, when people are talking, it's, it's almost as if AI wrote the script. It's so bad with how like the script is written, how everything plays out. And what's unfortunate because like you, Paul, I, I didn't read the book when I was in high school, but I can see a great dystopian story here. You know, we've gotten so many great uh, or at least I think really good um, dystopian young adults uh, adaptations. You know, you think about Hunger Games. Yeah. I even liked um, uh, 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 not Divergent. What's the one before that? Is it Divergent? I don't know. But the, yeah, there's Maze Runner. First Maze, one. Maze Runner. I love oh, yeah. Maze Runner. That was done really well. So you have a lot of the the the, the, the subgenre works, right? Um, but then you get the giver, which is probably just like the worst example ever of of adapting a young adult dystopian novel into a movie. It's so it's so poorly um so poorly put together and i just don't see how they thought this was a pro- like good enough to put in theaters um and then we get to taylor swift uh in this, <laughs> in this movie and all i could think is like they said hey we need someone who can play piano and is popular uh yeah. she only plays like four keys so like we're not actually playing piano but you know if she can hold a tune and play piano, like let's get her. Right? And I'm yeah, like, well, Taylor Swift is so much more valuable than that. <laughs> well, and what's crazy is, so I did read a little bit up on the book. Rosemary is never shown like this. Mm. She's only mm-hmm. referenced. Um, mm. So she's not a character in the book, basically. Interesting. And um, they were like, okay, well, let's put Taylor Swift in there. And, it's so funny, like watching this movie. Um, I will say, in a better movie, the color little thing that they do, very mm-hmm. cool. I was very into it. Like, especially when they went to the second one and it was almost full color, but not quite. I was like, yes, this is great. I'm having a great time with this. Uh, everything else is so boring, but like that kind of like twist was like, that's fun. Um, I, I get I the sense. I get the sense that they had to have some gimmicks to sell this film, and so I think the idea of what they did with the color was something that sold the film. 
um it was just kind of a unique idea to to get that that translation from the book yeah uh, idea to a, a movie a visual format so i get that i also i would venture to guess that taylor swift also helped sell this movie like hey we got taylor oh, yeah. swift on board let's get producers to throw more money at it you know oh. um so i think that there was just enough interesting decisions here to get this movie financed and then what they did with that financing i I can't I can't tell you uh, <laughs> why it wasn't spent more efficiently on better writers, on on um, on better uh, editors and and just a, be- a better cast. Honestly, this cast is not great for this movie. There, no. it's, it's so amateur. Uh, well, and you <sighs> talked about Taylor Swift. I think most of the money went to Merrill, who. Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Also has my favorite leap in logic that I have seen in a movie where she's um, like, I can't be here today, even though she's literally next door. But she does the entire ceremony live via this, like, projector thing. And, like, I thought it was, like, pre-recorded. It's like, no, she's talking to people. She's interacting. She can see everything. So why is she not there? Like, it's not even like she wasn't there for the, you know... um, actual shoot because i'm guessing that's the only reason was that she, meryl in the book though she's not it's the it's the same in the book that she but that character also her. isn't real in the book as far as i looked right she's only that no she's real no but i mean she's only in like two scenes she doesn't have the oh yeah it's lot. very small yeah it's like only that scene and then i think doesn't show up again and doesn't isn't the antagonist of the book um from what i read not i like really, when, but... yeah uh, I'm sad you didn't read it. I think you would have liked this book if you read it before the movie. I don't know now. Because, well, that's fair. Well, listen to the audiobook and then just turn off. But um, I was a huge fan of this book when I was a kid. I haven't read it in years. So, like, I can't say it holds up as an adult. But, like, the thing about the book that really is great and, like, the movie sucks at is, like, it will describe things like the him seeing color for the first time where they have like mm-hmm. the stuffed animal, the elephant, and he's describing it, but they don't know what it is, but they don't like tell you outright, like that's an elephant or he's seeing color. So he's just like, Oh, I saw something weird. And then slowly put together what he's seeing and slowly put together, like how this world works in the dystopian side of things, which makes a really engaging read where you realize like, Oh, it's really fucked up. Oh, they don't have color. I never knew that. Um, in the uh, movie, cool. it just fails to do that mm-hmm. completely because you visually see, oh, yeah. that's an elephant. You see that it's in black and white. I think the color effects are not that great. Um, the visual effects in general are bad. It also turns way more towards the end, like this big action movie trying to be a movie than it ever is in the book. In the book, there's like no drone action or random stuff like that. Um, so my biggest frustration comes from like it being an adaptation. I think this is a really shitty adaptation of a book that really never should have been, to be fair, made into being a movie. But I like I like to me. think that every book can be made into a movie with the right concessions made. Right. Like you have to you have to change some things. You have to accommodate the medium a little bit better. Um, And and I think that the color thing I did. The one thing about the color is that I don't know if I cared about the saturation being turned up and down. I wish it was more like like that. Yeah, I wish it was more like he can see certain colors now, like whatever color he saw in that scene. Now he can see in real life, but everything else is still black and white. Right. Like, I think that would have been an interesting take. Like, oh, now he can see red and now he knows what red looks like. He he did that. Not well, yeah. really in the movie. In the book, it's like that, but in the oh, movie, I thought, it's not. I, I guess just on my screen, I just thought it was like only red because they like looked fine. Yeah. Um, no, with I remember red color. being a color that they that they highlighted in the movie. But the 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 trick between um, going from black and white to color was the saturation level, not necessarily the oh, yeah. color spectrum. Um, and so I, I think that would have been um, interesting, but there's I mean, honestly, before that, there's so many other things that need to be fixed about this movie. Uh, it, it, I, so I don't think the adaptation worked. I don't, even without the book, I don't think the movie works at all. Um, and so it, it's, it does seem like another thing that Taylor Swift kind of just took on as another notch in her belt, I guess. Um, a fun project. I'm sure the book had a lot of uh, positive buzz at that point. So being a part of that was probably uh, in her interest. I don't know. I, I'm going I, to there... say, I, I was going to say, I think this is one of those that is a shocking misstep. And there's a couple mm-hmm. of these mm-hmm. where I think that she assumed this was going to be like 
the next Hunger Games or yeah. an Oscar play. And that's why she does this little yeah. small cameo like, oh, I get a piece of this. And then it just didn't. Um, I mean, it made money at the box office, though, which is insane. Like, I mean, yeah, I can't imagine today releasing a mostly black and white movie for teenagers and it making money. <laughs> that's <laughs> Regardless, fair. especially if an old book that's a school book like that is impressive. Mm-hmm. So, you know, good for 24. Not enough that they ever continued the series. though. Oh, my gosh. Um, they leave it on such a cliffhanger as if like, yeah, we have the next one in production. Like, no. You guys, right. well, and that's, I mean, that's the thing about film and filmmaking is that you don't, we see so many successful films, like a lot of films that go into the theaters that, you know, audiences can either accept or reject or whatever, but we, we, we know those as like, this is what a movie should look like. You don't know when you start a project, if it's going to turn out that way. Like you have to, as an actor or, or uh, anyone on a filmmaking team, just trust that the that the the people you're working with are going to turn this into something that looks like a functional film uh and you in uh, i guess a lot of times it works but a lot of times it doesn't this is one of those cases where it just did not and so i think your point about this being a misstep yes this was supposed to be a hunger games this was supposed to be a maze runner um and it just did not come out there is somewhere something along the line um it just did not turn out i think and i think it's the casting of most of the other people like mm-hmm. um i cannot stand uh what was her name odea rush the girl who played fiona i every <laughs> single scene when they were like oh we're sending you away or whatever it's called i was like yes finally <laughs> every scene with that character i was like stop being so annoying um really frustrating character to me but um uh, yeah overall uh very forgettable and yeah. As we've noticed, all she does is little play the piano. And like, that's also such a important character beat that like, they don't, they both don't give her a chance to do it. And also like, mm-hmm. it's just kind of a lot of tell don't show. And it's like, okay, well show us You're, mm-hmm. if you cast Taylor Swift, if she's in it, do it. Just show us. <laughs> mm-hmm let her play the piano guys like yeah. she can do more than one one note let her cry time, once promise. we already <laughs> saw that she can cry in csi <laughs> uh, i think as far as ranking this one i kind of have to put it down at razzie's i think the film overall like i hate the movie but i do think it has enough good ideas present where i can kind of forgive some of it just on ambition but like i do think swift is awful here i think she's used bad i think she is bad for me, it's a Razzie performance. I don't know about you guys. There. I'll give it. Um, yeah, because uh, I don't think I would Razzie any of the others. And I feel like I got to do one. So this will be the mm. one. This will be the one. If if I was to give a Razzie, this one would be it. I would blame so much more about the rest of the film before I blame Taylor Swift. Um, so oh, yeah. No, I agree. I'm, yeah. But so I'm, I, I'm I going just... to personally give it a, a, you know, back back to the vault performance. The movie gets <laughs> all the Razzies. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> well, Paul, I can't believe you skipped the biggest performance we're talking about today, Elaine from New Girl. Um, I oh. did not watch any i don't know what new girl is to be honest i watched the 20 second clip of her standing up at a wedding new girl new girl is so good yeah, well <laughs> we'll see i've heard that now twice today but um <laughs> my friend she love. stands up at a wedding she yells some stuff and that's it so it's, it's not a lot here yeah um you watched it right before we started recording yeah on the call um i mean so. so yeah it's just a little nothing scene but what's funny about it is this scene has led to a lot of Swifties having a false memory of a speak now music video. Um, (laughs) That adds up. It is very speak now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, So like people talk about it all the time and they're like, wasn't there a speak now music video? And they're like, no, it's the new girl episode, but you just visualize that you saw that. And then I think they mixed that in with um, from the concert movie, her doing the little speak now skit. Mm. Um, for um when she sings speak now and i think that those two are just merged into people's head that there's a music video that doesn't exist so that's all i know this from um yeah it it very much was like this must just be a show she liked and they were like you want to be on Mm -hmm. it um 
but they were also pretty good kind of emulate speak now you know it's it's kind of on brand for like yeah like her music and love and you know running off fairy tale thing you know yeah and new girl uh i'm guessing someone in the production was a really like tight with a bunch of music people because um one of the most famous episodes is the prince episode that like, was a great that's one of my favorite episodes in tv yeah. history it's a fantastic it's so episode <laughs> um so like you know i think that that's like a thing i can't i can't remember if this came before or after that but um yeah i think that that's it's just a little cute cameo um i am surprised that again she's used so little S- continues to be the the running gag um is that no one really does anything with her um i'll i'll say she did her best because i thought it was cute yeah. it's, it's fine mm-hmm. um very much just a move on but um yeah if I, we go out of order i would love to introduce the next one okay. because that i didn't really do a new girl and i think you have more to say about the last one but certainly as the cat stand here as the cat fan who's seen it uh, multiple times in theaters and at home and i saw the production on stage um bob Lorena is probably one of the best parts of the movie which i do appreciate she is an agent for mccavity she is the one she comes down on a big moon and sprays cat nip into the audience or into the jellical cats to drug them um so they can steal the jellical ball for mccavity um i think even if you dislike cats and i'll be honest i know a lot of people dislike cats right i'm not going to go off on this i've done that enough on this podcast of why it's good <laughs> i think you have to say this performance is iconic the way it's shot taylor swift with sass the song and also if we're talking about Taylor Swift just in cats in general not with this role she did write a song for this that is very good beautiful ghosts I would recommend um, but I think this is the high point of the movie um, I think it's just iconic truly like I think even the friends I hate I'm like let's at least make it to Taylor Swift who they hate cats and we always make it and I like hey, you're time my friends I hate <laughs> those who don't like cats <laughs> well, my friends I hate <laughs> Here's the Look, thing about definitely drawn arguments. <laughs> here's the thing about this. Um, I I was telling you guys, I I tried watching cats. I got through the jellico, the obnoxious jellico cats uh, number, <laughs> and, and I think I I may have gotten to Rebel Wilson's introduction. Um, and I was the naming was, of was, cats. Was, it's such a rough song, and it yeah. comes so early that I do understand when people are like, I can't do this. Yeah. It's like so, it's the one that I'm like, why did you not cut this? There is no reason for the naming of cats no to be reason. in the musical. It also has the extended bit of like the ballerina dancing that isn't very mm. good. Yeah, um, yeah. kind of boring. So like, I I I won't hate on people who love cats. If you like cats and you love cats, whatever, great. I am so happy for you. Um, one day I might try to watch it again for this podcast. Um, I I did not. I just couldn't. Um, uh, but no, I did, that is. Fair. <laughs> but I did watch McCavity, uh, the the number. And let me tell you, the most disappointing thing about McCavity is the fact that Taylor Swift has not come out with a jazz album yet. Um, that is, is so much proof that she can do jazz, right? And and we've seen her we've seen her conquest a number of genres. She's gone from country to rock to pop to uh to folk. You know, and she's she's so good at doing it too. We see this time and time again with every album. So, where is your jazz album? You know, Lady Gaga yeah. got into jazz and did that successfully, so we see that there is a blueprint that Our can be followed. Um but uh but that's that and I say that to say I liked that scene. It's so Taylor Swift. Yeah. It's so sassy. She pulls off the whispery vocals really, really well. She has the performance. I would love to see that live. Um, if that was a number at one of her concerts, I would love to see that live. So this this is a good uh, showing for Taylor Swift. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's No, it's, it's one of the best. Um, so what was funny is when I was talking, I was like, oh, she circled roles and then um, never really... Uh, got one but i haven't heard of any major ones the only one i know of is les mis where Mm. she was up for two different roles um but they said that she was a little too in between the two roles um and let me pull it up specific i know what the roles are i just can't remember the characters um i know one's amanda seyfried's role Mm. and then um uh, the other one was um, Samantha Barks' character, a uh, smaller role. 
but they like they had two roles that they could have given her, but they were like, your vocals are closer to this person, but you look more like this person, so we're not going to give you either. And he said, oh, I'll make it up to you. With cats. <laughs> like, Oscar nominated film. Yeah, I Pat. know. That's that's what I mean. Is like this woman is like cursed. Like <laughs> she likes cats. That's her gimmick. No, though. I know, does, but like true, and she does, and she went theory. to she went to the cat school that you were only supposed to go to for half a day, and she went every day that you could go to yeah. go pretend to be a cat. Um, she had a great time. Um, I, she, I think her dad was the one who came up with the catnip, which is like one of the best parts. Um, and um, originally, this song is actually sung by two people, and. I remember I was not that big a Taylor Swift fan at the time. Um, I like liked her music, but I was not like huge, huge, huge. Um, and I was so bummed that there wasn't a second um, singer because mm-hmm. McCavity, um, when I was a kid, was my favorite um, cat song. I saw cats once. Don't remember any of it. Remember McCavity. And I used to like play McCavity. Um, but to your point, you cannot get the vinyl of cats. The movies, uh, the the movie, and not only that, and I still don't understand this. How have they not done like an RSD of McCavity on one side, you know, a seven inch, and then uh, Beautiful Ghost Taylor's version mm-hmm. uh, on the other side? It would sell like gangbusters, and it would be like a funny little thing that everyone has. Where mm-hmm. is it? Um, so that's my petition. Um, <laughs> but like in general, if they had, on a- if I thought there was a vinyl. I went to go buy it, and then I realized it was only the CD. Um, I was really disappointed um, because I thought it would be so funny to just have that in my like collection. Um, You know, what's interesting. I I don't I think cats may have come out before vinyl started really catching on because I know that there's always been uh, a vinyl collectors and that that, I mean, that's always been a hobby, but I don't think it it, it's been mainstream enough until just recently, really. Yeah, it was really COVID because this was 2019. Yeah. It does seem yeah, like yeah, COVID so, really like stratosphered it. Um, and right, also right. it's Taylor that does it. So like, you know, it, she's the main vinyl seller. So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, when Taylor does something, everybody does it. And so, yeah, yeah, so vinyl, vinyl with Taylor makes sense. And I think it, I, I can just imagine the marketing team for cats was it, it just hadn't caught on enough for them to think that, far ahead and honestly they were also probably just trying to like pr their way to the oscars and I, don't yeah. think that, I think that that took a lot of their time which obviously didn't uh well, didn't really procure anything pan out which um i will say that this is the um one that i'm a little surprised and i don't think she will ever have a beautiful ghost or carolina moment again where she does a song that she really attempts and they don't just fucking let her get nominated Um, I understand that out of all of the categories at the Oscars, the two that are the most rigged are um, music for nominations, at least is music and documentary. But it's Mm -hmm. just very surprising to me that like specifically, and we're not talking about Carolina. So I'll just put it here. Carolina is a great song and it's very surprising. It would have been great to hear it at the Oscars. And then you look at the other songs that were nominated that year and you're like, but why? And then Beautiful Ghost, same thing. I understand nominating cats for anything felt hard to do, but it's like one of the better songs in cats. Like it feels like it fits because you do need um, like, you know, memory is the song that everyone's there for. Mm-hmm. Um, but to not have another type of memory song because memory was written. Um, it's the only one not written based on the T.S. Eliot poems. It's just its own fucking thing. So not to have another kind of memory song is weird. Um, But uh, adding that in, I do do think if the movie was good, it would have worked. What do you mean? What if? (laughs) I mean, I have it as a four star, but, you know, I have a um, I I have a list of uh, terrible movies. I still get four star because I have a great time with them. Um. But yeah, I think uh, this was, you know, I'm going to give her the Oscar. But, give her um, the Oscar. Absolutely. It is like, yeah. it's also insane. Like, 
you were talking about that you didn't watch through it. Uh, the first time I saw it was opening night. I went with one, one of my best friends. We pre-gamed. And we went and all of us in the theater realized what was happening at around the same time. And we're in a group psychosis. Like I have never laughed harder in my entire life. But then Taylor showed up and it was like everyone was gone. It was like we were now at, you know, doing mystery science theater. And it was like there had been so many things building up. But when she got there and then McCavity shows up and uh, you wouldn't have seen this that often. McCavity's always wearing a coat and then takes it off for this. And no one has ever been like more nude. <laughs> just all that is in that shot. <laughs> like you're just really like, oh my god. <laughs> Which is so weird because everyone else is not wearing clothes, but for some reason it's just like oh. That's why it's so funny. I'm like, wait, aren't all of them nude? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But he's been clothed, like very right. clothed. And then <laughs> just like strips it down and you're like, well, why did you strip it down? <laughs> Um, and then, uh, Carson's always excited about this one because it led to, uh, London boy mm, is that's true. James Corden is on London boy in the opening. It's the uh, interview. So they're talking about I- Idris Elba and, uh, James Corden are on the opening for London boy when they're talking about the scooter. Um, and it's because of this movie, they try to edit James out, but they can't. He talks over it just that <laughs> little bit and he's there just that little bit. Did you see Tom Hooper came out afterwards and was like, James Corden was awful in Cats. He like tore him apart in the press. That's so funny. I mean, correct, but <laughs> <laughs> sure. But out of everything in Cats, like Tom Hoover, just let it be. Well, um, well also, but uh, remember, which a lot of people like, you know, got onto them at the time. But at the Oscars, uh, Corden and Wilson made fun of the Cats. Look. It's been my Twitter profile for uh, like a header for years. <laughs> I just switched it, but it, for years it was that. That's so um, funny. Do you think we're going to get Beautiful Ghosts in London as a surprise song? Um, yes, I do. Now, do we get McCavity? I'm not sure, but I do think we get Beautiful Ghosts at some point. Um, I also like, I kind of think that Beautiful Ghosts, even though it won't make any sense, might go on to Rep TV. Um, there's oh, could you imagine? I kind yeah, of feel like it might, uh, because uh, there's two options. Um, this is like either she's going to do deluxes of everything after, so it would go on um, Lover, or she'll just put it onto Reputation. Um, yeah, I'm so of two minds on that because I do think that people will be like, "You're doing deluxes, but also you don't have to buy them," so it just gets messy. Mm. Mm-hmm. I would like it on uh, reputation, even though it makes no sense. Um, it would be very funny. Um, oh, we did not read. Okay, so for The Giver, she was in the movie for 1.94% of the movie at 1 minute and 53 seconds. Cats, however, 7.45% of the movie with 8 minutes and 11 seconds. Um, second right. only to <clears throat> Valentine's Day. Um, in terms of but she is in the movie more because somehow valentine's day is longer than cats <laughs> cats what? isn't that long though I know, kind of like... that's crazy a whole musical compared to like a rom-com mm-hmm. um but uh so this we are in general seeing like the the twist from um taylor going from uh, just doing any movie to like, she's definitely trying to win an Oscar. She's definitely wanting to, she's trying slightly to follow in Gaga's footsteps um, with less acting um, because she actually makes music. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, so that leads to um, the most insane Taylor role, um, which I had heard of. I did not watch till just now. Um, this movie is horrible. It's called Amsterdam. It's David O. Russell. Um, I had always heard it was terrible. I didn't believe it could be as bad as everyone was saying. Uh, this movie makes no sense. I, you wrote me and you were like, I cannot wait till you find out what this movie is about. I'm like, I finished the movie. And I still don't know what it's about. I was just sitting there <laughs> like, what is this? 
it's uh, everyone doing terrible performances. I think it's like Margot and John David Washington's like worst performances. Um, Christian Bale also is bad. It's just like really terrible. But then there is a shining light and it is Taylor Swift Mm -hmm. who, even if I was not a fan of hers is having so much fun in this movie that no one else is having. I'm like, this is great. And then um, I knew what happened to her, but I still was like, there's no way she gets more to do than this. Right. She's like a major part of this movie. You have entered like, so basically she's introduced and she's like, my father was murdered. Find out if he died. And you're like, okay, cool. There's, you know, this whole like noir mystery thing. This is actually fun. Um, And then she sings at a corpse. And then leaves a restaurant that she told them to meet at and then immediately gets pushed and run over by a bus car. <laughs> thing. And it is so weird because I had seen that clip, but seeing it in context, it makes no sense. Like this is the movie feels like it's going in one direction and then it just changes and then goes back in time. It's so bad. But like yeah. that is the last ounce of enjoyment I had for the next hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, I actually I literally turned the movie off after that happened. Yeah. Uh, I mean, wait, Taylor's not in this anymore. Why do I keep watching? She uh, <laughs> she shows up one more time um, in a flashback just for you to watch her get run over again. <laughs> <laughs> And I screamed. I was like, why? And they're like talking about it. And they're like, that poor girl. <laughs> it's like, it's so weird. But like, so she, I think is having a good time. I think gets what this movie is. She has a fun little accent going on. She's really good in it, I think. And then to cut her, especially to replace her, with Margot Robbie doing the worst Margot Robbie performance in a while, uh, it feels like a a lesser um, like Babylon, which I don't particularly like her in Babylon, but this is like rough. This is like the first draft of that performance. And I was just like, I wish Taylor was still here. And that's such a weird thing because after I'd watched all these, I was like, she's not the world's best actor, but, and Margot Robbie is, I love Margot Mm -hmm. Robbie. Usually whatever was going on with this role it seems like everyone's miserable to be there in a very like visceral way um, yeah i need i need a movie which, to explain so that great. movie being made um like what yeah. was going like were you guys did, was catering just not that good uh on this set like yes. why are you guys so <laughs> so annoyed with this so miserable <laughs> well and what's so weird is like every uh, you know as you watch there's like a new star every like 10 minutes and you're like, Oh, hello, Zoe Saldana. Like, what are you doing here? You're in a thankless role as well. It is like, it's so strange how many people are in like horrible thankless roles for this like bad movie. Um, and I don't even understand, like I was trying to imagine just the script and I was like, well, maybe it just didn't work on screen. I'm like, no, the script is boring. Like, why do we go back in time for 15 years? And then it's like this thruple situation, but not really, but kind of. And like that nothing happens. Um, It's just, it's real bad. I know you didn't rewatch Carson, but um, it was miserable. I rewatched her clip, but also I saw this in theaters. I don't particularly like like this movie i think the director is obviously awful but like i will say watching the movie in theaters with no context of what's going to happen and having the taylor swift car crash was genuinely like i'll never forget the moment like i can tell you where i'm sitting in the theater because it's also just such an awkward cut and it looks so bad and it was shot and then they replay it so let's be clear they do replay it but like (laughs) it is just it was one of the most shocking moments i've had in cinema but then as you say you get a depression because you realize that's the one thing i wanted in this movie and now we're done with taylor swift (laughs) and we're 15 minutes into the movie so um i have to stay here for like two more hours yeah um i think it's a terrible film i don't get though and i even rewatching it i don't get why you love her in this movie i think her accent is like not great i think she's funny i think the i the, think that's the what murder it is. of taylor swift is funny but I, other than that i don't think i think her accent here. is so funny 
Um, I just like, I had like a good time with her on the screen. Um, I also like this movie, I think is supposed to be campy and she's the only one doing a campy performance. Um, Mm -hmm. like I feel like if everyone had dialed this up to 11, this movie could work, but they're all being very reserved in a movie. That's like all hijinks. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, they're like, Oh, um, it turns out Taylor Swift was picked by Margot Robbie to help them out. And like all this, you know, uh, all these plot lines and stuff are like so dumb. Oh, you know what? I will say that Taylor is replaced by my next favorite performance. Um, Arguably, I'd say better. I really loved Anya Taylor joy in this, and I don't usually Mm. like her. She's so funny in this, just being awful. Um, Later on in the movie, Anya Taylor joy shows up. She's clearly the villain. And the whole time she's just being like, the meanest person alive and it makes no sense for the plot and you're just like she's just sitting there constantly (laughs) saying like rude barbs and i was like this is fun i'm enjoying this too um but yeah like that's it there was like these two female and they were like kind of felt very similar to me the only two people who knew what kind of movie they were in um and then everyone else was bland but yeah um listen i haven't given her the oscar before i'm gonna give her the oscar for this but Best actress, not even supporting. Mm-hmm. She's gonna be best, like Lily best. Gladstone and run in the wrong category. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a whole lot to say about this movie, and I also can't say a whole lot about her performance because she's not in it a whole lot. But she does get run over by a car. It does look awful, but I think you make <laughs> a lot of valid points in the fact that I think I don't think. And, and I, again, you, when you sign on for a movie, you don't really know how it's going to ultimately turn out. But I just want to know where in that process did everybody start having such a awful time making this movie? Um, so the movie gets Razzies yeah. again. Um, but I'm going to say she tried her best. I agree. I think she tried her best. I think this is not as good as her performance in Cats, to put it there. Um, (laughs) But she definitely tried. Um, So she is in the movie for 2.52% of the film. And uh, that is three minutes and 23 seconds of movie. That feels high. But right. We got to get it. She does have the opening bit. I guess I just think she has a car crash, but she does have a little bit more. No, she has that opening bit where she sings at her father's corpse. And I wrote Carson. I was like, what is happening? I, that is the other thing. Uh, you didn't watch enough of this movie to know. Um, they sing constantly for no reason. They don't explain it. They're like, it's something that we do. I'm like, okay, cats. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it just keeps going nonstop. Um, like, uh, it's horrible. Um, I... I also love that all of these movies have a Taylor Swift character poster on Letterboxd, and I switched all of them. The Giver has a Taylor Swift cover. I was like, switching, I want everyone to know why I watched this. I didn't just watch The Giver. (laughs) Why does she have a... a, Why is there a Taylor Swift cover for The Giver? She is barely in that movie. (laughs) She has one one for everything. Um, The only one that uh, she doesn't is Valentine's Day didn't get its own character poster, which I'm going to guess they probably did. They just haven't been uploaded. Um, Mm. Someone made a fake one, but it's that uh, style that's really popular right now where it's the cursive on the side that they've been doing nonstop. Wouldn't Valentine's Day be the one that she's most qualified for a a character poster for? That and Cats are the only two that I'd be like, yeah, she's got eight minutes of movie. Um, (laughs) Incredible. Wow. But, well, I think looking back at her filmography overall, n- not a ton of great stuff in here. Again, not a lot of leading roles or anything crazy like that. But I think, you know, she normally shows up to set, gives her best, um, normally with flawed material. So I, I appreciate it. I appreciate that we went through these. Um, let's go jump over to our, because this weekend, guys, we did get a new Taylor Swift album. Paul, I know you are obsessed with the Tortured Poets Department. Oh, yeah. So I'll turn over to you first, just very quickly. What are our thoughts on the album? Because I do want to talk about it. Um, so it, it was a very weird experience um, l- listening on night. And I know most people who like Taylor Swift also felt that you listen to an album and then there's a little countdown on her site and you're like, oh, something's coming. 
And then you slowly realize that none of the lyrics that she had been showing everywhere were even showing up on the, um, in the album. And uh, the assumption was prior to the drop of anthology that it was just going to be the black dog, the bolter, the manuscript and um, the albatross would just like drop. And it kind of like, subverted the controversy of oh you know each vinyl each cd has its own one it's like okay we just did it like this um you get them on digital or you can buy them on physical totally fine um then my stepsister writes me and she goes 15 and i was like what are you talking about there's no way and then it like i was having so many troubles with apple music um which okay i will kiss them slap them kiss them with apple music real quick Apple Music sounds so good that when I went over to Spotify because Spotify was working, I was like, wow, the quality is different. Like I was listening midway through one song and then I switched over and I was like, I can actively tell how low the quality of Spotify is. Um, But Spotify was fucking working. So, you know, (laughs) Um, the first time I listened was like half on Spotify, half on Apple Music, which will screw up my metrics. It's very upsetting for me. Um, it's going to be like, oh, you never listened to this middle part of the album. Like I did. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, you know, it's 31 really good songs. Um, I think my favorites are the ones that are more about her relationship with her fans than Maddie Healy. Um, I have to keep listening through on those. But yeah, I think I can do it with a broken heart. I think Clara Bow. Um, but daddy, I love him. All of those where it's like arguing with the fans and like the controlling fandom. I'm surprised there's no anti Gaylor song actually. Um, even like not even like not speculating on her sexuality at all on the flip side. Um, I'm surprised there's not one that says don't like she had the chance to at this point where it's very much like I'm airing my grievances and I was surprised that there wasn't that, but not like upset. Um, yeah, all all in all, it's, um, you know, very interesting. Um, I I mean, I love it. Uh, I'm disappointed that I'm going to have to wait a while to get the anthology on vinyl. Um, that's going to be really frustrating for me. I know it's probably going to be like the RSD drop or something like that. But um, like, I really do love the first half of the album but I'm very excited about the second half as well. Um, It feels very much like a, we were talking about it earlier, put on the vinyl and just kind of like relax, listen to, you know, drink wine or smoke out or whatever, and just like hang out and vibe. But yeah, no. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah. You know, so I, I was, uh, of course, anxiously waiting by my phone at, uh, we're on West Coast, so, you know, 8.55, uh, you know, before the 9 o'clock drop of the album. Um, And so I did, as soon as 9 o'clock hit, I did go and listen through the first half of the album. And it's funny because I thought, huh, it's only an hour long album. I guess that that's okay. Um, So it it makes sense that there's, uh, there was more to come. Uh, I just wasn't clued in on that at that time i was too busy trying to just like enjoy the album um but i i agree with the sentiment that this is an album that i can see myself like on a solo saturday night just throwing on vinyl uh sipping whiskey to and just chilling right like this is this is certainly an album that i that i can vibe with on like uh you know, just evenings where i just want to drink and chill um so i like that from a vibe perspective um i think that i'm very interested in getting around to the second half of the album i haven't actually di- uh dive in dove dove, dove. In, <laughs> dove into uh the the lyrics just yet um like trying to like dissecting the lyrics and the and you know the messages and all of that stuff um i really just wanted to get a sense of like what vibe we're going for here um and and i like that so uh, you know, over the next few weeks, I'll be listening to songs over and over again. My favorite from the first half at this point, um, you mentioned, uh, uh, but uh, um, you mentioned yeah. I can do it with a broken heart. Uh, I do like that one a lot. Um, uh, but daddy, I love him, which is interesting because I, the first time I listened through that, I was like, huh, that sounds like one that people would like, like yell at a concert. 
um it, it certainly has kind of anthem feels yeah. to it um so uh, i i look forward to that being a part of a tour at some point fingers crossed eras maybe if she feels so compelled to include the tortured poets department um and then down bad i like that one a lot too oh yeah um i also uh, go ahead yeah i also like the guest that she brought on florence and the machines was a really great feature uh for florida um and uh and so yeah i'm i'm positive on the album so far but the only negative that i have to say is i'm still waiting for that jazz album yeah (laughs) no um definitely um I also, um, I was going to say, I think it's interesting that like, so when I was listening the first time, I was wrong on pretty much every single one of the songs on what I thought they were about. Also, I was very drunk, Um, (laughs) especially in the second half where like, I thought I was going to bed, maybe listening to a couple more and no, we're doing it again. We're, we have a whole new album. Um, So uh, I was writing one of my friends and she kept going. Um, I thought it was about this and I'd listen the next morning. I was like, you're right on that one. You're right on that one. You're right on. I'm so mad. Uh, specifically like <laughs> Clara Bo, I just was completely off on. I thought it was about boyfriends and it was like, no, it's definitely about us. Um, but I, I was trying not to listen exactly what you said. I wasn't listening with lyrics. Um, because, um, I don't really pay attention to anything. If I'm reading with the lyrics, I'm just like staring. Um, and sometimes you just need to let the, you know, you don't have to understand every word sometimes. Um, but yeah, I think it's honestly one of her stronger efforts. I've also seen people saying like, oh, I don't want to hear about her personal life. And it's like, I, my question to that is, okay, but like, that would be like any other artist. You're like, oh, I don't want their signature thing. <laughs> like, this is our modern, like, you know, we have like, a memoirist just like to music and that's what this is like it's not she's not going to like change from that and that's what you expect from her but it was just very funny like people i usually agree with are like it's just too auto autobiographical now and i'm like that's what we want from i i don't want go listen to folklore that's what i was gonna say (laughs) like i love folklore and evermore but like we did that and that was recent yeah it's recent midnight and midnight is somewhat about herself but it's all very vague um and so this one is the first time that you're like um okay we're back to red really Mm -hmm. reputation possibly um where it's like here are my feelings here are my thoughts and here's what happened um because like lover and all those are you know there's realistic stuff in there and stuff to her life, but like not really as intense as we've gotten um, in years. So, you know, I do feel like it's different from what um, people are saying. I also think it's going to be one of those, like almost all Taylor albums where people initially, it seems like most people genuinely like this one, but um, I do think it's going to be one where like in three, four months, people are like, Oh, actually, you know, choose a random song slaps. It's so good. Like, um, I was writing Carson and I was like, what do you mean? Um, I look in people's windows is like an iconic song and you haven't gotten there yet. So in the second half, but like the first time I listened, I was like, that's cute. And now I'm listening. I'm like, oh my God, the lyrics in this are insane. Like, um, you know, and I think it's also really cool. Um, I saw a lot of people say that this is the first album where she doesn't care if it's accessible, Mm -hmm. like the amount of references, Um, the like, uh, basically her showing off that she's smart too, um, is like really interesting because she usually does when she does these like references, they're very like light, very surface level, but like, and I mean, I guess Cassandra, for example, isn't like the deepest of deep cuts, but like, it's not something that just the average person is going to go, Oh, Cassandra from Greek mythology and da, 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 da. And like, I can listen to it and I know exactly what you're talking about. Like that's, you know, it's interesting. It's cool. Um, and you know, I also think that a lot of these slap, they're like, great. They're like good dance tracks, surprisingly for such a like heavy, dark album. Um, not just, I can do it with a broken heart, but like even some of the Desner ones down in, uh, the anthology, um, but I'm excited to keep listening. Um, 
my vinyl come on uh, i got all four um come on uh tuesday um so i'm excited about that um and then yeah no it's cool i also got the hat (laughs) nice yeah it it was like one of those drops and i was like do i need a hat and i was like if i don't get the hat and it sells out and it did sell out i'm gonna be so annoyed it's my only tailor merch i'm trying to be very careful about that because like uh, my apartment is disgusting in terms of the amount of Taylor lore sitting around. It's like a museum. You yeah. can start at one point, and I did this sitting <laughs> on that couch right behind him. I was stood at one point in the room, and you look, and you can never have a line of vision without something Taylor Swift. It's so. the problem. Okay, the the problem is I have my vinyl collection, but then also um, I got a bunch of those um, like things from the AMC movie when they were giving them out for a dollar, and so I just like. I use them as my water cups and like they're great water cups. If they had done it for Kong Godzilla or whatever, and they had them for a dollar, I would have bought those too. They didn't. They only did it for Taylor because they had so many of them. Um, So now I need that. (laughs) Like, um, so yeah, but it, um, it has to be curated now. Otherwise I will look insane. And that is my biggest fear. Um, like, you do look already insane when you have your like Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl hat. Okay, that out. was like, only that, there's insane. a reason for that. Um, the reason was my uh, stepsister's uh, boyfriend um, was a big who's the other team? 49ers? Yeah, yeah, 49ers fan. And he was being very annoying at the Super Bowl. And so um, when uh, Kansas City Chiefs won, I bought the hat and then I wear it every time I see him just to be annoying because he said, he said, who was the other team? I couldn't <laughs> relate with that so much. I couldn't relate with that any more than I do. Like who else played yeah. in the Super Bowl? <laughs> yeah. who, who the fuck was it? It was Taylor Swift was a... two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you had not said Kansas city chiefs, I would have gone Taylor's boyfriend's team. Um, <laughs> and I have a hat for him. Um, and there's a reason it was the most watched Super Bowl of all time. But um, yeah, no. So um, it'll all be fun. I'm very excited to um, see how this album kind of grows on me. But yeah, uh, what are your cars? What are yours, Carson? Um, I like it. I Normally with Taylor Swift, she's one of those artists where like you kind of mentioned with Twitter, they do this where like I listen to the first time and it's like, oh, this is a good sound. And then as you keep listening, it slowly starts to build the identity and I start to like it. This one pretty much right away. Like there are songs stuck in my head continually. Um, I think it has a really good. Um, I mean, I like what you mentioned about like you can dance. Like there's a lot of energy here for being so dense and being so you know uh, poetic at times of being so dense um i i quite like it i think especially the i think the second half of the album is better than the first half um but i think it's all pretty strong i don't really get there's a lot of hate i think the hate just kind of comes from people like not liking taylor swift at the moment which is fine valid but like i think it's weird to say this album is bad because i think both lyrically and in sound and in energy energy it is good and it's also an evolution we talked on our episode about the concert films the evolution of how she references her boyfriends and how she references her drama we talked about that and this feels very return to form to like the speak now world tour right so like i do think there is a lot here to appreciate as a taylor swift fan um and as someone who's consumed just the most taylor swift media i can this year due to our episodes um <laughs> i thought it was quite rewarding so i am definitely a fan of it yeah yeah it was uh, that episode where we watched all the concert movies. Like I was on another plane of existence by the time we were getting around to Lover because it was like it, each concert is like two hours long and they're all the songs you know, but they're slightly like you had to pay attention. You couldn't just have it on because we were trying to like discuss them. And like it was just so much and they were all the same songs, not in a bad way. It was really fun. Like I, I see it as like the people who finish marathons are like, oh my gosh, but I did it. <laughs> like, yeah, sitting there like drinking Gatorade, like, let's go. <laughs> and then when Era's the extended cut came out, I was like, okay, one more time. <laughs> but yeah, no, really fun. Um, is anyone I, is anyone going to the the Era's tour before it ends again? Well. Um, let's, 
let's assume that she adds more because no, I didn't get tickets like you. I was so I mad. I know where you're going. That's good. Yeah, so I, I went in Seattle, which I was very happy and fortunate about, and managed to get tickets to Vancouver, the second to last show. Um, oh, awesome. I feel like there is another. There's another show that was added um, in the Middle East. Well, she's adding some in Europe, I believe, in Turkey. I want to yeah, say, yeah, yeah, around there. Over there. That's, a, that's and a she's adding part, more in, but yes. Well, yeah. Well, they're the countries. Like it's happening, so I mm-hmm. assume it's happening. But right. like but, everyone but Taylor Swift has said it's going and, on. So but, um, my my theory on what's going to happen with eras, and I think I may have told both of you this, but I haven't said it on the pod, is that I think that. Um, she may redo Loverfest in that sense for Tortured mm. Poets, especially now that we know there's 31 songs. Mm. Um, I kind of think what we may get instead of it being added to eras is she does like a couple residencies in like major mm. cities. So like LA, New York, you know, maybe like a London or something like that. And she just like sits down, does it for like two weeks and then mm-hmm. goes oh my two, goodness. three weeks. Um, the, the demand for that uh, yeah <laughs> it's, it's just it, i just see it as the only way because you can't do another tour like no. clearly especially mm-hmm. when listening to these songs it's like this woman is like <laughs> we are lucky she didn't off herself <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> on <Heavy>. stage <laughs> um, <laughs> but like uh i think it'll be very interesting um because i think that that's what you have to do especially with this album because there's so many songs like what is she going to add to the eras tour? There's, we don't even know what the popular ones are yet. And I think um, she's already sold the thing. Main thing though, she already sold the tickets. There is no incentive for her to Mm -hmm. add it to the eras tour. That's a valid. Um, But uh, the only reason she would is for Grammys, but since she won this year, um, I think she has a, and you know, Cowboy Carter and Billy coming out. Um, I think she has an uphill battle if she was going to get that. So mm-hmm. we'll see. That would be the only reason I would see. Otherwise, like you're going to spend a bunch of money to help scalpers ultimately. Mm-hmm. Because, um, but I do think that every show for the rest of this year will get a uh, Tortured Poets surprise song. I, if anything, awesome. maybe she'll do yeah. three surprise songs or something like that to like really get through, you know. But no, it's, she'll just do a um, what's it called? Where it's like multiple songs. Um, oh, mashup on the word. She'll just do more mashups. That's her new thing. <laughs> yeah. Mash-up. Well, now now that we know that she had thirty one songs, it makes perfect sense why she was doing those mashups. She's just like, let's just play around. Um, <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, very excited for London final night when they get London boy followed by so long London. That'll be really great for them. Uh, it would be weird yeah. to know what they're getting. Like, that's the only one where I'm like, obviously, it's going to be the last <laughs> night. They'll do London boy. And my personal belief is that she will sing it in past tense. Not I love a London boy. I loved a London boy. Mm-hmm. And everyone will be very sad. Um, but uh yeah, no, this was you awesome. say that, but when she pulls out McCavity and beautiful ghosts in a full cat bodysuit, that makes Listen. her look like she's in the mo- look. I look, I'm just saying it should be one of the eras. <laughs> no lies detected. <laughs> if Olivia Rodrigo can come down in the moon during her concert, why can't Taylor? That's what I'm saying, but you know, and drop weed on all of us. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, I think we're going to do it for today's episode. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the episode, both at home and on the call today. Where can we find everyone on the internet, Paul? At Pricelike Tag on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Perfect. Thomas? Yep, you can find me uh, on social media at being TSJ. I typically post reviews, uh, or I guess I exclusively post my movie reviews and thoughts on uh, uh, thisisforreal.com and uh, associated platforms. And you can find me on Twitter at BP underscore movie reviews, Letterbox just Carson Tamar. Thank you so much for listening. Again, this is our last Taylor Swift episode for a while, but there are conversations about how we can do more. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> but for now, we're closing the chapter on Taylor Swift and we'll be back next week. Three. That well, that well, spoilers, no spoilers. <laughs> um, next week we'll be back to discuss challengers, which if you know me, I'm very excited about. So we'll see you then. Goodbye. <laughs>